Welcome to our new podcast series, Privacy Abbreviated, brought to you by BBB National Programs and Osano. We hope to help business leaders operationalize and prepare for what's next in privacy. I'm Donna Frazier, Senior Vice President of Privacy Initiatives at BBB National Programs. And I'm Catherine Dawson, the General Counsel and Chief Privacy Officer of Osano, a data privacy compliance platform. On this episode of Privacy Abbreviated, we're diving into the metaverse and the privacy issues surrounding it. We've got a great guest today, Tracy Shapiro, a partner at Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich and Rosati. Tracy, thank you for joining us. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your practice and background in privacy? Sure. So in in terms of my background, I started out at big firms as a litigator. Uh, I then spent about six years at the Federal Trade Commission in their privacy and advertising divisions, where I worked on policy issues and enforcement actions involving privacy and advertising. I spent time in-house at a large tech company, and now I've been at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati in our privacy group for nearly a decade. And then in my practice there, it's a mix of privacy counseling and regulatory defense. So on the counseling side, I advise technology and companies on how they can process consumer data. Often they're launching new products or features or looking to process data in a new way. And I work with them to spot red flags and help them with compliance issues. I kind of advise on the alphabet soup of privacy laws. I do a lot of COPPA, GLBA, FCRA, VPPA work. And then increasingly, of course, I'm working on state compliance. So the California and other new states that we've got coming into effect in 2023. Great. So... We're very excited for this episode and taking a look at the privacy issues in the metaverse. And obviously, everyone is talking about the metaverse. And maybe we really need to start with looking at the basics of how it's defined. So, Tracy, how do you describe the metaverse and and what do you think of what is in the actual metaverse? Yes. When I started receiving clients questions about the metaverse and what they should be doing in the metaverse, my first step was to quickly Google what is the metaverse. I, of course, had a sense of what it was just from you know newspaper articles and seeing futuristic videos of what it could be someday. But I wasn't sure about you know what is it now and does this actually exist now or is this something that we're going to see in the future? And so my sense now is what the metaverse is going to become eventually, whatever it is going to become eventually, it's now in the really early phases. So we have a vague sense of what kinds of online services currently exist that we could call the metaverse. Um, And my sense is it's often used as a shorthand for an experience that involves virtual reality and augmented reality, virtual worlds in which you can buy and sell virtual goods. Um, But it isn't always VR and AR. So, you know, there are existing current platforms that are already hosting virtual events that are not ARVR. So for example, Fortnite has hosted virtual concerts that you know you that your avatar can attend. And I think my sense is nobody knows exactly what it's going to evolve into. So you know maybe one day it will be a fully immersive VR experience where you can do you know nearly everything in the virtual world that you can do in real life. Maybe it'll be a replica of a city and you can walk down the street and pop into your bank and engage in a transaction. And then your hologram self pops into a bar to meet up with friends. Maybe you'll have an exact replicate, the digital version of your home and have your friends over for dinner. And in a way, asking what the metaverse is right now is a bit like asking in 1996, you know, what is the internet? I would have said, well, you can send emails and you can view web pages that load really, really slowly. That's what it was at the time, but people much smarter than I am had this vision for a, a, you know, a greater thing that it could be. Or like asking in 2000, what is social media and saying, you know, it's hot or not. Uh, There's a site where you submit your photo and people tell you, are you hot or are you not hot? But we couldn't envision what would come later with Facebook and Snap and TikTok and whatever it is that comes comes next. So, I mean, so obviously there's so many different ways for companies to have a presence and do business in the metaverse. And you've touched on some of that. If we stick with the companies whose like primary business operations are intended to be in the metaverse, what do you foresee to be some of the biggest privacy challenges? So I I think of the privacy challenges in kind of two different categories. One is the really practical logistical compliance challenges. And then the other bucket is the higher level, more 
philosophical privacy challenges. And so with the first category, the practical challenges, it seems to me like the metaverse is, at least right now, just another form of online service. And we'll be able to adjust our existing laws the same way we did when you know, mobile apps became a thing or when IoT devices became a thing. And we as privacy lawyers always have this moment of panic around, like, how are we going to apply existing privacy laws to our clients' new technologies? And then we get creative and we figure it out. So with things like, how are we going to do privacy notices? How are we going to get consent from consumers? It seems like one challenging question and one unknown right now is whether we're going to have interoperability in the metaverse. So in other words, you know, is the metaverse going to be one interoperable virtual space where you can kind of move from business to business and experience to experience? Or is it going to be a bunch of different virtual spaces operated by different companies? So, so it, there won't be a, such thing as the metaverse, but rather there'll be a series of metaverses. And so if we have a series of metaverses operated by different companies, and in order to interact with those companies, we go through a traditional account creation process, then it seems like some of the practical challenges like notice and choice are a little less daunting, right? So you would have a traditional account registration process on your device, and businesses can make privacy disclosures at that point in the UI and get any consents that are necessary, but if, on the other hand, there's sort of one interoperable metaverse and I walk around from experience to experience, then it seems like the practical challenges might be a lot more challenging. With regard to the high-level privacy challenges, you know, one of the challenging issues is that the metaverse seems to straddle this space between being an online experience and being an experience that's like the physical world. And I think figuring out which rules of the road apply, kind of the online rules or the offline rules, is going to be one of the big challenges. So, for example, look at location tracking. So we have certain privacy laws and industry, st industry standards that apply to the collection of an individual's precise geolocation information. I think with the metaverse, there'll be this question of, you know, is location tracking in the metaverse, is that, is that a person's precise geolocation information? Or is that more like information that shows you visited a certain website? So, you know, let's say it's the year 2045 and I virtually go to the bank. I have a virtual doctor's visit. I swing by a political rally and hit up a Pilates class. Are those movements of mine more akin to I visited four websites or is it more akin to tracking my real world physical movement patterns? And, and if the law concludes, well, no, this is more akin to you visited for websites, then it seems like a challenge is, have we lost a great deal of our privacy in the metaverse? Because that's how we're living a good portion of our lives. And another interesting question, I think, will be just what are consumers' expectations of privacy? So you know, the law affords us greater protections of privacy in our person, in our homes, even our cars. And so one question will be, are our consumer expectations of privacy more akin to that in the real world or more akin to your traditional online experience? And I think that's a super interesting point that it's still a little too early to tell, but this experience of the metaverse, I think people are, one of the goals is that it feels real and it's sort of seamless. And so if you're doing something on the metaverse and switch to something else, another game or another experience, having an interface there that feels seamless is sort of part of, part of the goal, right? Of the app developers or the companies who are looking to engage with you. And so to stop and show you a privacy notice at that point is sort of not going to work, right? It's got to be a bit more seamless of a UI, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think, Tracy? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, if I'm popping into the bank, what, is there going to be a GLBA notice posted yeah. on the outside? And when I pop into that bank, after work, are they going to you know stop me and show me the privacy notice and the terms and conditions and have me you know, take a look at them and then consent? That seems like it would definitely kind of undermine the entire experience. So it seems like we'll have to get 
more creative with the notice and choice model, or perhaps as the Federal Trade Commission has been pushing for, like moving away from the notice and choice model and having more kind of substantive privacy protections in the metaverse instead. Right. Have you seen any clients approach this in a creative way, or is it still too early to tell? Yeah, I would say right now what I've seen is companies still doing things in a very traditional way. Right, because we don't have this immersive universe or metaverse yet, and it still is a separate service, right? So you are going to Fortnite and registering for your Fortnite account, or you're going to Facebook's metaverse experience and you use your account there. I think I've seen notices and choice still being done in a traditional way at account registration in the EUI and in privacy policies. Makes sense. So Complicating all of this, obviously, is going to be biometrics, right? The, the data collection, the information that's collected in, in, in biometrics. And there have to be specific challenges related to that. On top of just the challenges of just pure, simple notice and choice, how do you tackle biometrics? Are, are you seeing your clients dealing with this? And, and how do you advise them to, to deal with this? Yeah, one of the biggest challenges my clients face with biometric information collection is where they have no consumer facing relationship with the individual, which, as we were talking about, might be a problem in a seamless metaverse. So, you know, Illinois, of course, has the strictest biometric data collection law and requires notice and consent and a biometric privacy policy. And so where my clients do data collection on the ground in a brick and mortar way, they can say, you know, okay, we're not going to offer our service in Illinois or even for an online collection, they can say, okay, we're going to IP address filter and block Illinois residents. Not, not perfect, but reduces the size of a class if they're sued in a class action. But where they don't have a direct relationship, they're collecting through a third party or they're collecting in the background. Let's say they go and get a, a photo data set from a third party. They don't know if the photos came from Illinois residents. They don't know if there's images of Illinois residents in, in the photos. That makes compliance uh, with notice and choice and doing the privacy policy impossible. And it makes filtering out Illinois residents impossible. And so you can see, you can imagine problems being equally present in the metaverse, right? If we have kind of people's avatars cruising in and out of our businesses, how, how are we going to get required consent if we're doing, if we're collecting biometric data in our spaces, and then I think there's other kind of questions that are challenging, which is like, what is biometric information in, in the metaverse, right? So certainly, you know, if a company is using your audio to create voice prints, there's going to be a risk that class action and plaintiffs are going to take the position that that's biometric information. But what about you? They're using my hologram in the future, to kind of do a facial measurement or take my fingerprint. Is that biometric information? What if it's facial recognition of my unique avatar, but not actually my person? Is that going to be considered biometric information in the future? Under current definitions, certainly not. But does that mean that we all end up with less privacy in the metaverse? Because if we do have unique avatars and it is like a real world experience, should those kind of protections be extended to our virtual information? It's just so many interesting challenges to sort of dive into and yet to be solved. But on the issue of biometric, for example, what will be considered biometric information, I think, is such a fascinating question. So for, for example, your hand movements or like keystrokes might, those patterns, your body, body patterns, I think that's a really interesting area where we're going to have to see just sort of how it evolves and whether or not that turns into, that falls within the definition of sensitive information. Yeah. And maybe, you know, maybe legislatures end up expanding the definitions, right? If if courts conclude, no, this doesn't qualify under these definitions that are in existing laws, maybe to expand privacy protections in the metaverse, legislatures say, okay, the world has changed and it's not about our real faces and our real fingerprints anymore, you know, only. And so we need to have kind of expanded concepts of biometric information. And particularly challenging, I think, will be how companies handle children and children's information. So they're early adopters of new technology, uh, including metaverse 
businesses and opportunities. And so are there particular, what particular challenges should companies be aware of when they're, when they're thinking through, okay, I, it, children will likely use my product or service in the metaverse. What, how should I be prepared to handle that type of consumer? Yeah. You know, as long as the metaverse looks like it does now, where we've got these separate experiences, then it seems to be notice and consent for, say, COPPA compliance can be done in the traditional way during account creation. So child, go get your parent. They need to consent and affect a credit card transaction or provide their email and we'll do an email plus consent mechanism. But if we do evolve to this more unified world and kids are existing and running around in this world, which sounds like as an aside, what is happening? I don't know if any of you read um, Kashmir Hill's article from this weekend in the New York Times, but she decided to spend a weekend in the metaverse. And that was her experience often was she'd walk up and start chatting with somebody who their avatar sort of looks like an adult. And then the voice would quickly reveal that they're a child and it would be an 11 year old who has borrowed their parents' headset and has ventured out into the metaverse. And so how is that going to play out? If we've got these kind of kids walking in and out of our experience, do we block everybody at the door and do an age gate and say, you've got to go get your virtual parent with their credit card or provide your parent's email address and wait patiently to come in until your parent consents? Does some new company come up with a new consent mechanism specific to the metaverse and submit that to the FTC safe harbor program? All of that seems like a very negative consumer experience, as you mentioned, Catherine. You know, I've got two teenage daughters and they do a lot of stuff online. I can count on one hand the number of times I've been requested to give parental consent. Kids are just good at getting around it. (laughs) But I think companies might have more of an indication that the user is a kid based on the behaviors that they're doing or biometrics, for example. I think, you know, there it might be harder for companies to say we had no reason to think that was a child. Yes, certainly the same rules of the road that apply now online will apply when businesses are operating in the metaverse. So If a business in the metaverse has a space that is directed to kids under the COPPA test, then FTC and the state attorneys general are going to say that when a child enters your space and you start collecting their personal information, you're going to need to assume that they are a child and you're going to need to comply with COPPA. Or even if you are a general audience space, if you obtain actual knowledge that individual is a child, then COPPA will apply. And so, you know, now online, you usually obtain actual knowledge because you're collecting a birth date. But an online service can also obtain actual knowledge because in a comment they post, I'm in the fifth grade and I love this online service. And and so in the metaverse, you can imagine all kinds of new ways that you might be obtaining actual knowledge. Like to your point, Catherine, through their voice. If you are doing any kind of detection through voice prints to ascertain a user's age, the FTC is going to say, now you've got actual knowledge and you need to comply with COPPA. And then I think there are some other kind of in other interesting issues involving kids. One would be online purchases. So the FTC has brought actions against companies like Apple and Amazon for allegedly not implementing adequate controls to prevent kids from making unauthorized purchases within apps. And I would not be surprised if regulators look at similar issues in the metaverse. So if, you know, if kids can just roam freely, walk into virtual stores and make online purchases that end up on their parents' bills, you know, are the companies in the metaverse responsible for that? Is the kind of the operator of the metaverse responsible for that? And I think this really kind of relates back to the point that there is sort of a blurring of the physical world and the online world with the metaverse. So if kids make a bunch of unauthorized purchases, is that more like 
if a parent gives their child a credit card and says, go shopping, you know, regulators don't seem to get too involved there. If your kid buy th- buys things that you, know, you didn't want them to, it's like, well, you gave your kid your credit card and set them loose in the mall. That's what you expect. Right. Um, or it's going to be more like the child online where you give them your phone and get an app and they make an excessive amount of in-app purchases where regulators did get involved. Another issue with kids is, I think, online content moderation. I was just going to say it opens up a whole new, a whole new moderation discussion. Right, right. So, you know, in most kind of online worlds or in social media, at least large companies engage in some form of online content moderation, addressing bullying and harassment and inappropriate content. And who's, is someone going to be doing that in the metaverse? Or is this more like the physical world where we don't have people running around and telling kids not to swear on the street corner? Well, and certainly there will be bad actors, right? Looking to take advantage. And so there are some dangers as well. Yeah, absolutely. To date at KRU, we've said that our privacy and online guidelines as a, as a cop of safe harbor, we've said whatever exists today applies to the metaverse, right? Until we see or hear something differently from regulators. I think one challenge that we're having with companies in, in discussing is constructive knowledge versus actual knowledge, right? Constructive knowledge, I think, is a slippery slope and can be very troubling for companies who are trying to mitigate in the in the metaverse space because what we're telling companies to do is collect the least amount of data possible, right? But in order to identify that this is a child and to, and to put up guardrails and protections for children, you have to collect some data. So where do you draw that line, right? And I think that that's becoming a real challenge for companies too because especially as we see the model of under 13 and over 13, the blind is blurring, right? The conversations are now becoming on a state level and a federal level, and you look at the federal proposed law, that children are no longer just under 13, they're under 18. And that children teen space is becoming very complicated. Yeah. And and on that topic of you, we typically try to collect as little as possible. I think there's also this question of what happens when California's new children's age appropriate design code right. comes into effect, which is applies to all children under the age of 18, you know, speaking of the age limits going up, right? So mm-hmm. under that law, if it isn't found to be unconstitutional before 2024, businesses need to take steps to, the, well, one, they need to take steps to ascertain who's a kid and who's not a kid. So to your point, now they're going to have to start kind of collecting information they didn't have to collect in the past to make a determination as to who are kids. And then once they know who's a kid, they have to make efforts to not expose them to harmful content or behavior. And so how do you possibly do that in the metaverse if it becomes a virtual representation of the world? Like, can you imagine a law that said minors under 18 need to be shielded from any harmful, to- harmful content when they're out existing in you know, real life? If we turn, Tracy, to other companies, so if there are companies whose primary business is not operating in the metaverse, but they're interested in, say, advertising in the metaverse or uh, offering an NFT of their own in a metaverse environment, are there privacy issues that you advise them about now to help them strategize or think about how to go about it? I think the traditional privacy risk mitigation strategies certainly apply. So implementing privacy by design, thinking about privacy throughout their product development, you know, data minimization and purpose limitations, collect, collect only what you need, use it for the purpose you collected it, only retain it for as long as you have a legitimate business need. If you're covered by a specific privacy statute, you know, a sector specific or state specific, you know, just being mindful that those are equally going to apply in this space. So Tracy, I think a big topic for our listeners might be advertising in the metaverse. And what advice would you give to clients around privacy and advertising in this way? There are particular concerns around making sure that ads are differentiated from native content. The blurring issue that you mentioned before, how, is, how do you make it clear that it's something sponsored content or advertising in order for companies to create an immersive environment? 
How are you advising clients to do this? Yeah, I do encourage our clients and I would inc- encourage clients that are thinking about doing this to look at a lot of the useful regulatory guidance that we already have that's going to apply equally to advertising in the metaverse, but be even more challenging. So for example, you know, the FTC native advertising guidelines from several years ago are particularly relevant. Content is made to look organic in the metaverse, but is in fact sponsored content, then companies are going to need to consider what kinds of disclosures they're going to need to make to make clear that that is in fact sponsored content and not organic. You know, the FTC is holding an event, I think next week or on the 19th, about protecting kids from stealth advertising and digital media. I think the, the, the guidance coming out of that will certainly be applicable in the metaverse as well. The FTC endorsement guidelines, I think, are going to be very relevant. So no doubt there are going to be a lot of advertisers looking to work with influencers in the metaverse in the same way that these companies now look to work with influencers um, on social media. And so if you've got influencers in the metaverse endorsing your product, you know, FTC is going to say that these guidelines apply and influencers you know, need to disclose material connections I think some tricky questions will be like if an advertiser provides, let's say, free digital clothes to influencers in the metaverse, right, or their hats or their shoes, are those kinds of material connections going to be need to be disclosed? So back to that comparison of is this like the physical world or is this like the digital world? So is this more like an influencer throwing on the sweatshirt that a fashion company sent to them? In which case, they are certainly not putting a sign around their neck that says, I got this a sweatshirt for free. Or is this more like when somebody posts something on Instagram promoting a free good that they received and the FTC says, yes, you do need a disclosure there. And, you know, it might come down to kind of consumer expectations and how they evolve. You know, in the endorsement guidelines, the FTC talks a lot about how would the consumer expect that this is an endorsement where there's a material connection just based on the context? Or would, would a consumer think that this is organic content? And I think it, it goes against what we were talking about before, sort of this seamless, immersive experience to have a disclosure that it's sponsored content, I imagine it'll really sort of stick out. I mean, if you do it properly, has has the FTC given any sort of concrete examples or guidance? I mean, other than you've got to make it clear, how, how do companies do that realistically? Like if an influencer's avatar is walking around with a Pepsi and that's sponsored content, how do companies clarify that content is sponsored? Right. I mean, it's, It's hard to give a concrete answer because we don't yet know what the world is going to look like. But let's say there are profiles in this metaverse, right? Let's say you can actually go and, you know, click on, see somebody in the metaverse and then click on their profile. Maybe it's a matter of having Nike partner in the profile using the type of language that we see in in Instagram posts currently. But yeah, I don't see a world where people are walking around with hashtag ad on their avatar. Right. Or a different colored avatar or something like that. It just doesn't seem like it makes any kind of sense. So we've talked a lot about the risks and the challenges. Are you seeing clients doing new and innovative things in the metaverse and seeing the benefits? Or is it still too early to see the benefits yet? I mean, I think it's very early, but definitely I feel like we're seeing more more and more live events that are that are taking place in the metaverse. And I've seen clients quantify, here's the benefit that they got from it. Not yet. Sort of still engaging in the conversation or the experience, but not necessarily finding definitive ROI. Yeah, it feels like those sort of early days when mobile apps came out and everybody said, okay, we need to have a mobile app now. And I think there's this feeling I I hear of like, we need to be doing something in the metaverse. It's a new thing and there's going to be lots of innovative things going on in the metaverse. And let's think about how our company should have a presence there and kind of what meaningful experience can we bring to consumers in that space that we can't bring to them on our current platforms. It's interesting. It'll be super fascinating to see how it evolves. 
So Tracy, we like to end each episode with a bit of a look forward for our listeners. So obviously in this episode, we've talked a lot about all the things that are likely to change and evolve. This is an evolving space, which is, I think, exciting for a lot of content creators, for those in the privacy space, the challenges are probably going to be never ending. So with respect to privacy in the metaverse, are there one or two areas or issues that you think we should be paying extra attention to? What changes do you expect to see in the next year? Well, one of the issues we haven't discussed yet, which I I do think is an important one, is government surveillance in the metaverse. So this also relates back to that question of whether the metaverse is more like a series of websites and apps, or is it more like the physical world? So if I have created an exact digital replica of my home in the metaverse with all of my same personal items, and I can invite people into my home to visit... I think there are interesting questions around, can the government come into my home and surveil me? Do I, do I have a reasonable expectation of privacy in my person or my home in the metaverse? If the government suspects I'm hosting a meeting with suspected terrorists in my living room, would coming into my home constitute a search? Uh, does the Fourth Amendment apply? Maybe courts will conclude there's no reasonable expectation of privacy at all. You've uploaded a digital copy of your house to a public space. But what if I put locks on my doors in the metaverse and I can control who comes in and out? Because does kind of that expectation of privacy that I have in my home extend to this digital home? Or in contrast, let's say instead of an exact replica of my house, I just create a totally made up fanciful house that looks nothing like my house. Do I have fewer privacy protections when the government wants to enter that digital home? And so I think those questions will evolve over time. Will I have that same right to privacy when I exist in this online world? Or is that only going to exist when I am in my actual physical body? Super interesting stuff. I think the government surveillance topic is, is certainly one that'll warrant a lot of discussion. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for joining us today. We truly appreciate your time and your expertise on the issue. It'll be fascinating to see how it evolves. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Leave us a review and let us know what you'd like to hear about next on Privacy Abbreviated.